Uh, welcome to Thoracic Trauma. I will be your instructor, Colby Atkinson, C-Shift, paramedic. Uh, first, I am going to tell you guys what I'm going to teach you. Then I'm going to teach you, and then I'm going to tell you what I taught you, which I don't know if that's effective or not. That's what it is. So first one, describe the signs and symptoms of thoracic trauma and then list the immediately life-threatening thoracic injuries. We're gonna go over the 12 deadly um, uh, injuries you can have with thoracic trauma, and then define flow chest and exactly what that is. Explain the pathophysiology and management of an open pneumothorax. Also, explain the hypovolemic and respiratory compromise and the pathophysiology of that. Also, describe the clinical signs of a tension pneumothorax in conjunction with appropriate management and contrast, those with the clinical signs of massive hemothorax. And then list the indications to perform emergency chest decompression. We're gonna be discussing that more. That's one of your actual skills you'll be performing, so we'll just briefly cover that. And then identify physical findings, including Beck's triad with the cardiac tamponade. And then explain cardiac involvement and management associated with blunt injury to the chest. And chest seals will also be something that we'll cover in the skills station. So first off, the <clears throat> thoracic trauma. Uh, the injuries may result from either penetrating or blunt mechanisms, and patients with potentially fatal thoracic injuries can be saved with rapid recognition, intervention, and transport. So five, well basically one in 20 of all isolated injuries to the thoracic uh, region are fatal. So pretty high number, and 25% of all trauma-related deaths are thoracic traumas. So this is a big one that kills people. And we'll go over the anatomy real quick. And basically, everybody knows just the basics here. The important thing to remember is where the veins are placed or in the arteries. So what we want to avoid is coming underneath the rib ever. And what we want to do is kind of hit the top of the rib and go up. So that's what you're doing. Those are the major things that we need to discuss for uh, the trauma. All right, so blunt trauma, that's direct compression of your injuries. Uh, it can fracture the solid organs like your liver or it can blow out your hollow organs like your spleen. And then the deceleration forces, that's like the shearing thing, um, the lateral shearings, everything in car wrecks that can take place. And penetrating trauma, uh, that's direct trauma to the organ or vasculature, meaning either you get impaled, gunshots, stab wounds, those are all penetrating. And then the energy transmitted from the mass and the velocity. So with anything that hits you, it also makes those ripple effects that can also cause damage. So we need to be aware of those. Thoracic trauma comprises ventilation and oxygen exchange in, sorry, compromises ventilation and oxygen exchange in the lungs and can also compromise the circulation of the heart due to impeding on it and making it so it can't beat or contusions. We'll get to all that stuff. Um, all that leads to eventually death if they're not intervened, if they're serious enough. So the signs and symptoms, the big ones here, uh, you can see all this stuff that we're always looking for. The uh, cyanosis is a big one if we're seeing that. The next disdain, the tracheal deviation. The asymmetrical chest movement, uh, chest wall contusions. Uh, you know, that's why we always strip them so we can see these things, see how they're actually breathing, see how it's, it's working out in a trauma. The subcutaneous emphysema, we'll kind of talk a little bit about that and when that occurs. Uh, and then uh, the breath sounds when they're abnormal. And this is one thing we should probably do more is listen to breath sounds so that we know normal breath sounds versus abnormal breath sounds. Because uh, someone named Ralphie mocked me early on when I was a paramedic, just fresh out of school, because I was listening to everybody's breath sounds and because I wanted to hear what they were. And he's like, really? You thought that guy was having difficulty breathing? I'm like, no, but it was just an opportunity to listen to breath sounds. So if we listen to good breath sounds, then we know when they're bad breath sounds. And so sometimes it's a good idea on patients, if you're bored in the back, just to listen to the breath sounds. That's my little pitch. And to tell Ralphie to suck it. Can I say suck it on this? 
Yeah. Good. I said it. Suck it. Uh, deadly dozen. Uh, this is what we're going to go over. All of these are the important ones that we need to be aware of and that we're actually looking for in any sort of a trauma situation. And the blast injuries, I wish there were more on, on that, like, or that we had more experience. Probably only a soldier in combat would know more of those blast injuries. They just don't occur as much around here. But there are some things that mimic it, and we'll kind of get, get with that. So the first one, airway obstruction. And this is secondary hypoxia. So a foreign body tongue uh, could be vomit or blood that they're aspirating. And one thing you have to think of, like if you come on a car wreck uh, and someone was eating a Big Mac, something like that, and they eat it and then they get in a wreck and they're choking on it. So think of the foreign bodies in that thing. Um, the tongue can get in the way. We have the OPA to fix that. And then the aspiration of the blood and the vomit, that's something we should always be vigilant on and never pushing that down into their lungs further. So if you ever see the blood, the vomit, that's a time to suction before we actually start bagging them. And then consider cervical spine injury. Um, if you can't assess them, if they're a non-responsive patient, then you can't clear their C-spine. And C-spine is different than using a backboard. So a C-collar is different than using the backboard, which is pretty much just uses a spatula at this point, just a reminder there. The flail chest. I've only seen flail chest twice. And one time I was like, oh, it sure looks weird and everything. The guy was COPD. His breath sounds weren't great to begin with. He'd fallen in the shower and he had a uh, flail chest segment, which is two ribs broken in two or more places. And it basically just makes it so there's no structure for the lungs to be able to um, stay open. So when you breathe in, the lung collapses. And when you breathe out, it kind of just gets trapped in there and it'll never exit or enter the way you want. So it just makes it so the ventilation is poor. This can be very painful as well. So what to do for this, ensure they have an open airway on all these. Um, you can assist with ventilations if their O2 starts dropping. On the two that I saw, um, we just gave them high flow O2 and they were able to maintain their SATs, but it was uncomfortable for them. And flail chest, anytime you see that, that's a low, load and go uh, scenario. And most of these are um, just a rapid transport because there's not a whole lot we can do for trauma in general. So the quicker you can get, to, get them to a hospital, it's always usually the best thing to do. And then consider early intubation with PEEP. Um, and the PEEP is just the positive end expiration pressure, meaning that when you bag them, it's giving residual air. Kind of think of a balloon, you fill it up with air, and then when they go to um, breathe in and out, it actually stays open and it doesn't cave in like the last slide showed. So you're not gonna get this cave in right here. It actually keeps the, the lungs inflated a little bit. And so that's what you're looking for with the PEEP on that. And then consider pain relief. Giving them a little bit of pain medication um, may be something, because it's extremely painful, so they don't wanna take a full breath, which can reduce the volume in which they're actually able to exchange their gases. So giving them a little bit of pain management might be a very good thing to help them breathe a little bit easier. Uh, the open pneumothorax, this is the sucking chest wound. And so this is just where air enters the pleural uh, space and then it impairs the ventilation because you can see it fills with air outside of the lung in the sac rather than letting the lung inflate itself. And this results in low oxygen sats and hypoxia. And the, it depends on how big the defect is as well with the pneumothorax uh, because sometimes they're so small the ER doesn't do anything. Um, other times they're big enough where they pop them in. I place two chest two, or sorry, this, uh, We'll get to this one. Um, one cool thing that Jake has done is getting us these, um, the chest seals that we have. And then on top of that, uh, we're gonna be getting rid of these um, petroleum gauze. They're no longer gonna be carried, which is kind of a cool thing. And again, this is one thing where not a whole lot we can do besides just putting the chest seal over top and helping with oxygen. 
and ventilation and maybe assisting ventilations if we have to. And it's a load and go scenario, just like all these. Uh, tension pneumothorax. So difficulty breathing, the anxiety, um, they're gonna be tacky. They're gonna be breathing, or sorry, they're gonna be breathing fast. And then this is where you're gonna get the distended neck veins and tracheal deviation, which is a later sign. Things have progressed a ton. Just by the, the lung inflating so much, it starts pushing on the trachea and sending it off from midline. Uh, I've seen two of these so far in my career. One guy jumped off of like a 40 foot cliff. A kid, like 17 years old, jumps off to kill himself. Wasn't high enough to kill himself. Uh, dislocated his shoulder too. And with the dislocation, when we just rolled him over, while well, I rolled him, put him back, his shoulder relocated. And that was his main thing. But as we were going, he kept having more and more diminished breath sounds. And uh, so we, we darted him on that one. And he seemed to be doing better, but he was kind of out of it too at the same time. Uh, we didn't get a rush of air or anything. And I don't even know. And he didn't have the tracheal deviation, didn't have distended neck veins, but it was kind of in vogue at the time to kind of any blunt trauma down there. Our medical control doc said, just dart them. If they've got blunt trauma to the thoracic region, go ahead and put a dart in them. If one's good, two's better. That was kind of the philosophy at that time to do it. Um, the other one, he was riding a little moped scooter and he got hit by a Mack truck at a stop sign. He was stopped and the truck ran through and, and hit into him. He was messed up and he started having um, diminished breath sounds on one side and it was like the perfect scenario and started having more diminished on the other. And we put a dart in this right here and we heard a little rush of air in that one. And the funny thing is he was just kind of moaning, you know, just rolling back and forth. We put that thing in and he came up like, Yarrr! like dying on from the pain of us sticking him right there. And we had to hold him down to, to put him, you know, be like, it's okay, it's okay. So this is painful and it did bring him up out of it. And he was messed up in a million different ways. And when he went, Yarrr! I think he said, basically was trying to communicate that that hurt really bad. So then we did this side over here. We didn't get a rush out of that side at all um, of air or anything, uh, but because it started becoming diminished on that side as well, we did. And the doctor was happy at the time with us, but Dr. Balls has come back and when he arrived, he's like, we are putting in way too many um, darts in these people. Like we're decompressing people that probably shouldn't be decompressed. And so he really wants us to stick with that distended neck veins and tracheal deviation before we go around and start putting these in. And me and Travis, uh, we went on this call and the guy had a biopsy on his lungs and he had subcutaneous emphysema, or subcutaneous yeah, emphysema on his arm and just crackles and everything from this thing. But he was maintaining these sats well. And still, if we had that patient over again, I would not put that in him because he was maintaining these sats and he did have the sub-Q emphysema. And one other thing Travis found out is when you have it under your skin here, the first thing that actually blows up and we didn't look is the scrotum. So the scrotum it may be something where you guys need to check this because that's the first place the air is going to get trapped and then it goes to um, underneath the skin. So those are the, the things. We maybe were placing too many according to Dr. Balls and maybe we needed to correct that and wait for a little bit worse or more clear signs before just blunt force trauma. Uh, so to treat that, ensure an open airway, high flow oxygen, decompress if uh, we see the distended jugular veins and the tracheal deviation. And this is a load and go scenario, nothing we can do. These people are gonna get a chest tube. So anytime you, you put in a dart someplace, they're gonna get a chest tube. And not that they weren't anyway, uh, but that's just kind of Dr. Ball's um, advice to us now. And you can see this on the x-rays of what it would look like. It's just simply, it doesn't fill up and you've got this dead space in there filled with, with air. Uh, massive hemothorax. Um, some of the signs of that, the anxiety, the confusion, they're gonna be just kind of out of it. Like I've, I've seen somebody with this and it's kind of like an impending doom and there's just something wrong. Like they don't really know what's going on. Uh, your neck veins are gonna be flat because of loss of volume and 
they say they're rarely distended uh, due to the uh, mediastial uh, compression. Meaning, so the mediastium, we should go over that real quick, uh, is just the central compartment of the thoracic cavity. Um, it's in between the two pleural sacs of the lungs where they sit. So we're just talking about basically this little region right inside here. And that rarely causes the uh, distension there. So we're not gonna see that, that type of a thing. And then uh, the breath sounds will be decreased and dull if percussed because if you're gonna hit something that's solid, like full of fluid, you're not gonna get that vibration and the percussion sound back out. And where if it's full of air, you're gonna get that resonance, that hollow sound. So when we percuss, that's the two difference is there, what you're listening for. And no, I don't think I've ever percussed anybody to find out if I felt like they were full of blood or full of air, uh, which would probably be a good idea if we did. And then uh, here's how you treat it. Secure an open airway, high flow oxygen, load and go. And then let medical control know early um, that you're coming in. Give the trauma team as much time as they can. This person is more than likely going to have uh, their chest opened up in some way or another. And just IV and look for a tensile hemonumothorax as well. And if you need to, you can decompress that if you start seeing those signs. Cardiac tamponade, Bax triad. So the three things we're looking for, hypotension, neck vein distended, and muffled heart sounds. So the muffled heart sounds, I always have a hard time with, especially with what we're doing. I think that's extremely difficult to tell. Muffled sounds versus uh, regular sounds. So that might be something where you need to get on it a little quicker so you can hear it before and after and have something to um, compare it to. And then the paradoxical pulse. That's another one that I think is kind of hard for us as well. So to, to find, <clears throat> because in the cardiac tamponade and the paradoxical pulse, basically what's happening is the, the right atrium is overfilling, causing the pressure in there. So you're not getting, you're, you're not getting this. So base, let me go back. So to, to check for a paradoxical pulse, um, it's versus it's what their blood pressure does versus their their uh, breath. So when you expire, if you have this, it'll be the higher of the number. And when you inspire, when you take the breath, it'll actually drop. And if it's more than 10 millimeters of mercury that it dropped in the pressure, then you know that you have a paradoxical pulse, which is hard for us to sit there and listen for those sounds as we're taking a manual BP to understand. And we're looking for anything over 10 mill millimeters of mercury in change. And then equal breath sounds and fluid in the, the cavity with the FAST ultrasound, which I had to look up. And the FAST stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography and Trauma. So it's just an ultrasound is what that is. So that's what they're gonna be checking for. And how we treat that. Open the airway, high flow, load and go, safe transport, notify medical control early. If you guys haven't noticed that all these are pretty much treated the same exact way, uh, start looking for that pattern. Treat for shock if we need to with fluid administration. And we can monitor and treat the dysrhythmias. So a 12 lead anytime when you're having uh, what you're, you're seeing changes in pulse pressures or anything is a good um, idea. It, monitoring. Uh, with a four lead on the trauma patients as well, and 12 lead when you feel like it's necessary. And if you have time, it's a good thing to throw in there on in your um, assessment and care. And then monitor for the same things, a hemothorax and a pneumothorax. Myocardial contusion. This is the most common type of cardiac injury because this can happen from just uh, the seat belt in a car you're coming in any or steering wheel, any of these things will cause this. And so it's just a blunt anterior chest injury. So anything that hits us in the chest would be, uh, can cause this. And it's just a bruised heart, which can cause swelling, which causes the, the heart not to be able to uh, be as efficient as it was. So they can have the chest pain. Um, it can cause dysrhythmias. Uh, the cardiogenic shock, which I looked that up, uh, as far as in this case, and that's pretty much, you know, it, they say it's rare, and that's, it's like rare, rare. So it's not really one that we would even pick up um, with the short transports we have and be able to diagnose it to the cardiac or the myocardial contusion. And then 12 lead for this is a good idea. 
and treat it the same way as a tamponade, which is basically the same thing again. Um, ensure the airway, high flow, load and go, uh, rapid transport, contact the hospital, um, 12 lead, and uh, treat for shock, treat for dysrhythmias, and watch for any of the complications that may occur. So we're looking for the, everything we've already talked about again, pneumothorax, hemothorax, cardiac tamponade, all these things that we're looking for, you're just monitoring vitals. So that's one reason why we reassess and check the vitals again, is looking for those changes that we can pick up. Uh, traumatic aortic rupture. Um, this one usually, if this happened in the operating room, you might have a chance, and if it, if it doesn't, you're pretty much a dead man. This causes almost instant fatality with uh, what's going on, and you're, you gotta be aware of this. Um, this can happen from any lateral force, so if you get T-boned in a car, this is one we should be looking for. This is how my best friend died down at the sand dunes. So he was on his dirt bike, and as you know, the soft sand, the silty stuff gets put on the north end of the dunes. It just blows over that way. He came over, jumped, and landed in that soft silt and stopped his bike. He went forward, didn't have a chest protector, hit his chest, ruptured his aorta, and he died out in the sand dunes before help could ever get there. Um, same kind of thing. He had like that. Uh, I wasn't there, luckily, but uh, he had that same confusion and that same, you know, anxiety and rolling around and everything kind of that we've talked about with those impending signs of death. So whenever we see those things, we should really, really start ramping up what we're thinking. Um, and I should go back. So the one of the, the pneumothorax there, too, we had a, a little kid in a car wreck over here. And they were in the parking lot of Murray High School is where we found them. So they're in the shadows of IMC. The parents didn't have insurance or anything. And they, they wanted to take the kid um, by themselves. And it was great. They're across the street. They could get there as quickly as we could. And the kid's sat was OK. But you could kind of see like he was kind of guarding it. And like, OK, but he really needs to get to the ER. And like, you need to get there quick. This isn't like go home and check on him or go to your regular doctor. Like, you need to go over to the ER right over here. And we're talking to him. And then they, they start doing these other things, like getting the car seat out of one car and putting it in there. And we talked to him again, like, hey, no, like, you need to, if you're going to go, like, you need to go now over to them and this took and then they're like here I'm just gonna go take some pictures of this and we're like no you don't understand like you need to get him to the hospital now and so hindsight I kind of wish I would have just been like you know what why don't you just let us take him that way you can deal with everything here on scene even though they didn't want him transported didn't want that uh, we, you could see that he was injured and you know it, he was still satting okay he was breathing okay breast sounds were great when he did go over there they did discover that he had a uh, a punctured lung, um, nothing serious or anything that was mild, but still, those cases right there, um, time is of the essence. So again, get them there as quickly as possible. Um, and the aortic rupture, um, you can have no signs of chest trauma. It's just that shearing, it just takes the right angle and a small amount of force to shear those arteries off. Uh, just like my buddy, he actually didn't even have any contusions on his chest at all, but it hit it ruptured that and out in the middle of the sand dunes he was he was a dead man um, it says you can have hypertension in upper extremities and hypotension in lower extremities that is one thing that i don't think we would ever catch if you are doing that and checking that they have hypertension in the top half and lower you are a great paramedic and you should continue on doing what you're doing and you probably don't need this class uh, tracheal or bronchial tree injury so most of the cases end up being by the carina, and that's just it, the bifurcation. So down at the trachea, the bottom of it, that's just the bifurcation there. And we talked about the mediastium, and that's just this, we're just talking about that region in between your two lungs, like in between the pleural sacs there. You're just right, right here. So if, and that's just, this is just talking about air escaping into that area right there. Um, ensure adequate airway, uh, cuffed E2, to past the site of the tracheal injury. So you may have to, if you can, I don't know how this would ever work, and I kind of looked into that to see what they're talking about. It says, if possible, on the, the slide, you can see that. But to know where that is, they might be talking right main stemming them a little bit or something like that to try and get oxygenation past where that is and then putting the cuff um, 
cuff in there, or I shouldn't say right main stemming them, but getting the cuff down a little deeper than normal and trying to um, get past that injury because it, that's where your injury is going to be is a little bit higher up here. Uh, and then monitor for the same things, pneumothorax and hemothorax. Uh, diaphragmatic tear. So this is kind of an interesting one. A severe blow to the abdomen can kind of just rupture your diaphragm and then it causes a herniation of the abdominal organs just to come up into the thoracic cavity. Um, and it's more common on the left side, which if you think about it, the liver is tucked up against the, um, the diaphragm and so it kind of protects it there. So you're gonna have uh, a little bit more often this will occur on your left side. And the breath sounds will be diminished because you just don't have that aid of the diaphragm helping you. And this is, I, I call BS. If anybody catches the bowel sounds um, or auscultating in the chest, you are a rock star because with what we do and everything and you're deciphering that you can actually hear bowel sounds up here when you're checking their breath sounds, that would be pretty awesome. And then uh, the abdomen appears to be scaphoid. And scaphoid, what they're talking about is just that kind of sucked in the concave abdomen and kind of a puffed out chest. So your chest would be out and just kind of caved in right here. Pulmonary contusion. This is, uh, we're looking at this from seat belts and everything else from the blunt or penetrating trauma from car wrecks to falling off houses to anything uh, that hits into you. This can take a long time to develop and it's bruised lungs is what it is, but it does affect how you um, can oxygenate your, your blood. So eventually this can cause um, hypoxia and it includes, the treatment is just high flow O2. And if it gets bad enough where you, know, you aren't doing it, then they assist ventilations and end up intubating you. But this one is kind of rare. This is one, look, this is kind of like a medical rekindle, how we tell all the patients afterwards, like, yeah, you're gonna be sore here, but if you ever have that impending doom, um, if you start not being able to breathe, and nausea, vomiting, all those things that we always tell them to recontact 911. So that's one of the questions we ask, you know, when have you been in any, have you had any traumatic injuries lately or been in any trauma? And uh, that's one we can pick up a couple hours later. The blast injuries, uh, that's just overpressured blast affects the lungs. It's the same thing it can cause. It can overinflate them. Um, the hit from here can cause contusions and everything else that we've talked about. Blast injuries are just rare. They wreck the, the hollow organs a little bit more than everything else. Um, then you can have penetrating trauma um, if a bomb goes off. So you, this can be more than just one thing. So this is a good reason to uh, strip and flip people. If there's a propane explosion, if it's an ID, if it's any of those things, this is, this is one to, to do a thorough examination. Not that you don't. I should say we should do a thorough examination on everybody. Um, if unrecognized, it will lead to death um, with all these things. It's the same thing. We need to intervene, high flow O2, load and go, and get to the hospital as soon as, as possible in a safe manner. Um, and pelled objects, this is the one. I don't know if you guys ever played this, but my, my brothers played it with me when I was little. And they'd pull back an imaginary arrow and shoot me with it. And then they come up and pinch you as hard as I could. And then they play the game, leave it in or pull it out. And if you left it in, they would just start twisting it. And if you pulled it out, they would twist it and let go and it hurt to pull out. So there's no winning that war. And so with these impelled objects, remember, we leave all the objects in and we move them, we stabilize them the best we can and leave them in. And then we monitor for the, the 12 deadly injuries, basically anything that's going on. And the same thing, how we treat this is oxygen, uh, load and go get them to the hospital quick, assist with ventilations, innovate if we have to, and just kind of keep those things in our mind. So traumatic asphyxiation, um, this is just caused by the severe compression of the thoracic <clears throat> cavity. So if we're talking about a kid that gets run over by a car or something like that, you're gonna look for the cyanosis above the compression. So blue arms, swelling in the arms, swelling in the head, swelling in the neck, 
tongue, lips, and just think of it as kind of like if you run over a balloon, the force of that has to go someplace. So you'll get ruptured um, capillaries up in the eyes and everything. So look for these things. These kids are gonna look super sick and you need to get them to the appropriate hospital as quickly as possible. And this is gonna be supporting their airway, making sure that it's open. This is one case where you're gonna avoid a cervical collar. You don't really wanna put pressure back on this in any way. And so kind of just splint them in a position of comfort or anatomical position with a pillow or something, but uh, don't do the cervical collar on this particular case. And each case is a little different, um, but then you're just gonna Uh, support ventilations, high flow O2, get an IV start and get them to the appropriate facility. Simple pneumothorax, this usually isn't as big of a deal. It's still going to be painful for them. They're going to have shortness of breath. Um, their, your main concern is monitoring for attention pneumothorax. And then if this is a healthy patient, you're probably not going to progress any further than just a simple pneumo. But if they are one of those patients that's kind of on the edge of respiratory compromise to start with, a COPD patient, emphysema, something like that, severe asthma or something that's aggravating them, if they do get a pneumo, this can push them over the edge. So you still need to monitor them and wait for their position or their condition to deteriorate and then intervene appropriately for that. Sternal fractures. Um, this is going to be very painful. And a lot of times these, the patient's O2 saturations will be dropped or diminish because of the fact that it's just painful to take a full breath. So they can be sat and not adequately, and there's not really anything wrong with their lungs, but it's just because they can't take a full breath. Still, this is something where you have to presume there's gonna be a lot of trauma inside. So the myocardial contusion um, is just presumed at this point, and that you're gonna have some sort of damage, swelling, everything else. If there was enough force to fracture the sternum, then there's enough force to do more damage. Um, simple rib fracture is the same thing. I've had a rib fracture before, someone to check me into the wall when we were playing floor hockey. Just fractured two of my ribs. Super painful, hard to breathe in. As long as you're healthy, again, these aren't probably going to um, progress any further than just painful. And if you talk to Chief Ellis, he had like 47 broken ribs on both sides of his body. And even to this day, his ribs are overlapped. So as long as you're semi-healthy and able to ventilate on your own, you're probably going to be okay. But we're just looking for those further down the sign, further down the road signs of severe or life-threatening conditions happening. Which is what thoracic trauma is. Again, remember, five percent of the life-threatening or the severe thoracic trauma end in death. So this is a major thing and that's 25 and it accounts for 25% of all the deaths from trauma are thoracic related. So again, remember to open the airway, oxygenate and ventilate uh, adequately, decompress the chest if necessary, seal any ch uh, sucking chest wounds, load and go, get an IV and take them to the appropriate facility. So thank you for your time. Tell Ralphie to suck it.